Hey, hi everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Akash. I'm currently working at Bito. Uh, in Bito, we build tools powered by LLM to increase engineering efficiency and uh, boost developer productivity. Previously, I was working as an SRE at VMware. Hey, I'm Mithun. I'm working as a SRE at Property Guru currently, and I've also worked with VMware previously. Yeah, so. The title for the talk today is Cognitive and Self-Adaptive System for Effective Distributed Tracing. So, as the topic is based upon distributed tracing, which is part of observability, so we figured we will talk about a bit about observability as well. So, I recently stumbled upon this quote, which it really stuck with me. In a world where software observability is the new norm, observability is our superpower turning chaos into clarity. So it's rightfully true. So we see there are dozens of you know open source tools based on observability. There are hundreds of organizations we are working on observability. So what really does it mean and why do we need it? So as of now, as we adopt a distributed architecture, we are moving into containers. I guess we are into containers and Kubernetes. That's why we are here. The systems are becoming more and more complicated. The, it's becoming more and more hard to you know, know what is going on at every corner of your software systems. So this is where we need observability. And uh, there is some set of data which is part of observability, which we usually look at it. And this is the data that uh, provides us the insightful information that we, we usually look at it. and. Uh, find a problem and then probably uh, stumble upon the solution as well. So this data exists in four forms, mainly metrics, events, logs, and traces. And for this talk, we will only focus upon the tracing and what problems did we face while implementing it and how did we propose to solve it. Yeah, over to you, Akash. Uh, yeah, so as mentioned earlier, for this talk, we'll be mainly focusing on distributed tracing, uh, which is one of the important pillars of observability stack. Uh, before we proceed any further, let's try to just understand what distributed tracing is and why do we need it. So uh, distributed tracing is a method of tracking application request when this request spans over mul multiple serv services and uh, span across multiple servers. Uh, this is a crucial tool in troubleshooting uh, requests when there's a high lat latency or there's a fault in one of the com components. Uh, some important terms associated with uh, distributed tracing are, one is trace. Trace is nothing but the path of execution of a single request through the entire distributed system. The other, uh, the other word uh, which is important for understanding uh, this and uh, distributed tracing is span, which is nothing but a unit of work within a trace that records details like time, uh, timestamps, IDs, and annotations. And to answer the question, why do we need it? Uh, because it is one of the uh, best piece of data we have, which help us visualize, represent, and an analyze to better understand our uh, complex distributed systems. In modern systems, where there are multiple services interconnected with one another and uh, working in sync and async nature uh, to provide user with the response, it becomes really difficult for us to pinpoint the uh, point of failure and understand where the issue might be which is causing bottleneck. Uh, especially when these services are uh, you know, deployed ac across various different uh, physical locations. So for example, let's just imagine a single user um, actions, like loading a simple page, uh, which triggers a dozen of microservices uh, uh, across different servers. If you know something goes wrong or you, the, you know the response is very slow, finding which component exactly caused this issue can be a very uh, difficult task. So it's like finding a needle in the haystack. Uh, this is where distributed tracing comes into picture. Distributed tracing serves as a map which tells about where the uh, issue might be or what is call it, uh, causing the delay, uh, delay in um, receiving the response. Uh, it is like having a GPS of our own applications, uh, and it more importantly helps us build fast and reliable experience for our users. 
So uh, as we covered distributed tracing, just let's just have a quick look at the history of tracing and what were the important advan uh, advancements that were made in the world of tracing. So in 2018, uh, that was the first time Google came up with their paper on Dapper, which talked about the implementation of distributed tracing in modular applications, uh, which was followed uh, followed by its impact. We saw the uh, saw uh, Zipkin and Jaeger come into existence in 20, uh, 2012 and 2015, respectively. Um, in 2019, open census and open tracing were combined to form open telemetry. Uh, open tracing majorly, uh, its objective was to provide consistent vendor agnostic APIs, uh, where as open census provide a library set, set for gathering metrics and distributed traces. Uh, before we move, uh, move to our solution, let's continue understanding what problem we faced. Uh, yeah, as, as Akash showed in the previous slide, the history of the entire distributed tracing over a decade. So, but it all started with Dapper, right? Dapper was the most influential implementation of distributed tracing, and it uh, basically had everything in distributed tracing. It, it, it told us about uh, how we can collect traces in, from our code, how we can instrument our code, how we can sample the traces, how we can save it, uh, how we can analyze it. So it was a it, it was a bible for distributed tracing. But we we don't want to go to uh, in depth about everything that Dapper told us. We will only go in depth about the sampling strategy that Dapper used because this is the problem that we mainly faced and then the solution that we came up with. So Dapper mainly used a head-based sampling approach. Uh, Okay, so first, I'll talk about why do we even need sampling and tracing system, right? Uh, so, any software systems in on an average basis can yield around thousands of requests per second. And if you talk about a higher throughput system, they will yield about a millions of requests. A millions of requests means millions of traces as well. So we, cannot, we cannot save all these traces in our storage server. That is uh, not very optimal and that will just increase our storage cost. So what we do, we sample it. We save only a small amount of traces. So what Dapper did, Dapper implemented a very easy strategy. It, it, it used a head-based sampling approach. A head-based sampling approach meaning that the traces were sampled on the onset of the request, meaning uh, it did not analyze the entirety of the trace it uh, it was it was not focused upon from where the trace uh, originated from where it ended or what was the request code in it or any other metadata a trace might have it was just a random sampling approach where we uh, where we just checked say the sampling uh, frequency we set it to 5% so we will select only randomly 5% of the traces that are coming in so these were the main problems. So we, we have used the terminology here, the unusual and the interesting traces. So these are the traces which we feel are really the traces that help us uh, identify the problem and help us whenever there's an issue or whenever we are debugging a issue, these are the traces that really help us. So these are the unusual and the interesting traces. So when we were using a head-based random sampling approach, uh, by, by using a Jaeger or a Zipkin implementation, there's a data, we were only able to collect about 2% of the traces that were really interesting, that were really helping us debug an issue. And apart from that, 98% of the traces were your usual 200 status code traces, which in most of the cases, we will never look at it. So, yeah, so in hit based sampling, uh, most of the times what we do is, when we are not able to catch uh, interesting traces, we increase the sampling frequency. Right? We'll say, okay, 2% is not working, let's make it 5%, let's, let's make it 10%. But then again, we just need more storage for that. Right? We, we, save more, we save more traces, we increase our cost of our tracing system. So how did we solve it? So we solve it by using a tail-based sampling approach and I let Akash explain it in more detail. Yeah. So as we uh, learned in the previous slide, 
uh, a more traditional approach uh, for sampling the traces is head based where the decision to sample, sample a trace is made at the creation of the event, and it does not wait for the completion of the entire event, uh, which limits its ability to make any kind of intelligent filtering, uh, you know, to uh, filter the traces and store only the meaningful traces. Um, our solution here proposes a more novel approach to this problem uh, by implementing a, uh, by taking a, a tail-based sampling approach where the traces will be uh, saved of uh, uh, sorry traces will be persisted after the entire execution of the event so uh, this allows the tracing system to apply intelligent filtering technique and to retain much more uh, valuable tra uh, traces so uh, as you can see in this solution uh, there are three major components uh, that feel, uh, that you know uh, builds a system one is pan aggregator other other is adaptive sampler and the four, uh, third one is trace cluster uh, clusterer along with this we use kafka as a queue uh, in order to persist our uh, spans span events so uh, to start with uh, each of our microservices is set up with 100% sampling rate to publish all the events uh, span events into the kafka uh, this needs to be done in a synchronous uh, asynchronous, uh, asynchronous manner in order to minimize the performance overhead of the by the application on the applications uh, so yeah let's first have a look at uh, span aggregator so once the events are published into the kafka and span aggregator receive those events from the kafka and the main responsibility of span aggregator is to stitch all these events to together in order to form this complete uh, tra trace execution uh, trace exec execution so um, actually here's how it works whenever the span aggregator receives a new event from kafka it looks for a span uh, basically a root span uh, that can be identified with the span which is not having a parent id indicating the start of the event uh, this is done by firing a sql query to collect all the spans from the kafka and collecting all the matching trace id uh, of of the event uh, of the span so in order to form the entire uh, trace history uh, so once this uh, this are connected and reconstructed to build the full trace, we pass it on to the adaptive sampler. So that is the sec second component, uh, adaptive sampler, which acts as a bridge between the span aggregator and the trace cluster. So what adaptive sampler does is take the span uh, sp uh, a trace from the span aggregator, and it. Uh, it uh, forward that span to uh, that trace to trace cluster and it waits for uh, trace cluster to uh, provide it with the sampling rate uh, and the, uh, then adaptive sa sampler uh, checks whether it needs to persist that trace information or not so uh, actually the main uh, brain of our system is uh, trace cluster adaptive sampler just has the responsibility to act as a mitigator between span aggregator and uh, uh, trace cluster and uh, persist the uh, traces into the st storage system. So yeah. Uh, so moving on to trace cluster. So as I said, uh, trace cluster is the brain of our sampling strategy. Uh, it is a cluster engine that uses a density-based clustering algorithm called dbScan uh, to group similar traces. Uh, it does a few important things for us. Uh, one, it uh, forms a feature vector of each traces. Uh, as you can have a look at the feature vector here, it is nothing but, but uh, aggregation of all the spans along with some extra metadata in order for us to better understand the uh, history of the trace. The, this serves as a data point uh, to a cluster, cluster, uh, clustering el algorithm uh, later, later on. Once uh, we are able to uh, make this entire feature vector, second part, which uh, you know uh, our trace cluster does for us is this groups this tra trace cluster into uh, uh, traces into small small uh, sorry traces into clusters and assign them each with a uh, sampling rate. So if we want to look at the entire flow of this uh, trace cluster, here here's how it will look like. Uh, for every incoming request that is passed on by uh, passed on by the uh, adaptive sampler to trace cluster, 
uh, it is first transformed into a feature vector. This, uh, the trace cluster also maintains a cache of the n most recent of uh, feature vectors in a queue. Uh, this is done, uh, th uh, this is a configurable pa parameter and can be changed accordingly. For each incoming feature vector, uh, this cluster updates in real time and calculate the dynamic uh, sampling rate. So for every, uh, so for every incoming, uh, you know, uh, trace, it will auto, uh, automatically update the uh, cl cluster and try to calculate the dynamic sampling rate and pass it again to the adaptive, uh, ad uh, adaptive uh, sampler. So uh, trace cluster always assign a higher sampling rate to clusters with a fewer data points and lower sampling rate to the cluster with uh, more da data points. This approach is taken in order to uh, maintain a uniform distribution and a more balanced approach to the spans uh, uh, traces which might be you know uh, different in nature uh, to yeah, to sum up the solutions once again so what we are essentially doing is configuring our microservices with a 100% sampling rate and publishing all the events to the kafka queue uh, span aggregator is the um, is the one which stitches the span together and tries to form the complete trace of this exec uh, uh, the request execution adaptive sampler is responsible for persist uh, for persisting the traces, it decides on the sampling rate provided by the trace cluster whether it will uh, persist the traces or not in the uh, system, uh, storage system. The trace cluster, on the other hand, uh, is mainly responsible for clustering these traces together and uh, determining the sampling rate for each of these clusters. So, yeah. Yeah, so just to conclude, uh, as I told before, we were not able to capture the unusual and the interesting traces, right? Uh, we were only able to capture about 2% of the unusual traces when we were using a normal head-based sampling approach. But when we started using a tail-based sampling approach with this uh, entire uh, DB scan algorithm and creating clusters and then dynamically, uh, basically dynamically assigning a sampling frequency to every trace, this way, we were able to capture a lot more uh, interesting and the unusual traces that you will say. And uh, what analysis we did, we were able to capture the same amount of unusual and interesting traces by using 36% less data servers, the uh, storage servers. So if we are using the same uh, storage servers that we were using before, then we would be able to, able to capture a a lot more of uh, unusual and interesting traces, and they would be uh, of benefit, definitely. So another thing I want to talk about in conclusion is uh, this system is self-adaptive, right? Uh, Any time a new kind of trace will come up, this system will dynamically create a new cluster and dynamically assign a sampling frequency to that kind of trace. So we are not creating any kind of policies or any kind of rules or we are not hard coding anywhere uh, that uh, these, this kind of trace should be saved this time of uh, this percentage of times. This is all self-adaptive system, so it adapts to itself. And another thing, it's, it's just an idea, right? This is an idea. It can be implemented anywhere with any kind of tracing libraries. We have a lot of tracing libraries nowadays. and. Uh, the previous talk as well, it was based upon open telemetry, and we can definitely uh, plug, the, plug this idea with open telemetry as well. So, yeah, that's all we have for today. Thank you, and if you have any questions, please. Please feel free to ask any questions, or yeah, we will love to connect as well, and if you have any ideas, we'll definitely love to collaborate. Uh, excuse me, do you have public information, uh, for example, the GitHub history for your work? Sorry? Uh, do you, uh, so, did you, uh, so did you publish your work uh, uh, so publicly, for example, GitHub repository yeah. for your work? I couldn't understand you. Can you please speak up? Hmm? Can you please speak up? Uh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> so is there 
public repository of your work? Is there a public repository of your work? Oh no, this is, we have not open sources this idea. This is still uh, what we did in our previous organization, so we never came along and, but it's definitely something in future we will, we, we will plan to uh, create a, you know, open source repository or open source service which can be plugged into any of the tracing libraries. So uh, yeah, yeah, okay, understood. And also then, then you have your prototype implementation internally. And if so, so did you do uh, so quantitative so evaluation of the precision? Okay. So, could you please? I think the question is whether you have already implemented it and also executed a variation of this on the field. Yeah, we have already implemented this. This is, yeah. Thank you. So my question is on, uh, you, this is very trace focused, right? Yes. But in open telemetry and uh, the, the model, you need to observe all the traces to generate metrics out of it, mm -hmm. which can then be fed in to make uh, sampling decisions based on the other talks that we were uh, discussing, right? Mm -hmm. So here you are stitching purely traces. So uh, is there, if, when you are doing that, that dense clustering model, uh, like if I want to sample metrics uh, based on slow transaction time or anything, right? How do you make that determination in this model or it, it was purely a different one? So this was purely a distributed tracing model, a purely distributed tracing implementation, but it's, it's an idea, right? Uh, it's it's only an idea, right? We can plug it with any kind of. Uh, we can definitely try it with uh, metrics as well. So yeah, but we only tried it with tracing. Yeah, wait. This was really cool. Um, I had a question about the trace cluster. Um, like, to what extent did you control like what attributes of a trace it was looking at to make a decision on which cluster it should go into? Like, is it looking at just duration, custom attributes as well? Um, how does that so most part of the system work? What we did was we tried it with Jaeger, right? Jaeger gives you a, a, a feature vector, a set of data that is outputted by Jaeger, and we converted that into a feature vector. So it has data like from where did the span originate, where did it end, what was the request code, and other metadata any labels or any annotations uh, you are doing on the service side, these kind of data was converted into a feature vector, and that feature vector was fed into the uh, DB scan, which is an unsupervised learning algorithm, and that is from where we got that cluster. Yeah, that's really cool. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question. Um, open telemetry collector now uh, has tail sampling, uh, which it's definitely not uh, at this advanced level of decision or it's more on static decision, but it's still possible to do. Uh, have you looked into that, like what part of this uh, would it like reduce or would it be pluggable into, uh, again, existing tail, tail sampling in open telemetry? If I understood, understood your question correctly, you are asking whether we can use this with open telemetry. Uh, no. Uh, Right now, Open Telemetry Collector has support for tile sampling. Right. right. Yeah, and uh, uh, so basically, it can do uh, like all non-smart part of this mm -hmm. can can be done on collector. Uh, yeah, just in general, if have you looked if this is integratable with that specific part or maybe just even extendable? So the. Uh for this idea, the I would say the selling point is the it, it's self-adaptive. And what open telemetry collector, I guess it has tail-based sampling, right? Yes. Yeah. So and that tail-based sampling, if I'm not wrong, it's mostly based on we write some rules and we write some. Yes. Yes. So this is more it will adapt to itself. We have we do not have to write some certain rules and maintain those. So this will adapt on the basis of new sets of traces that are coming in. We don't have to go and edit the collector and edit new sets of rules or policies. So, yeah. 
Thank you. Any more questions? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone.